Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. I'm sure that we're all preparing ourselves for the festivities of the holidays and the like and this, that, and the other. But at the same time, business still goes on. And naturally, one of our, in fact, as far as I'm concerned, one of the biggest gifts or the best gift we could probably have for the coming year is that of the education of our kids. I mean, that is the, those are, those are the, the futures, if you will, of, of our way of life and our style of life. I mean, it's very, very important that we, we focus a bit. And all due, in all due respect, some, all of a sudden, we've got something on the plate. And I'm talking about the governor. As you know, the governor just recently enacted, if you will, himself as the, I call him the new chairperson of the board, the new educational board, and they're in the process of looking for a new superintendent, kind of a one-stop kind of a deal, catch all. Uh, but anyway, uh, there's, there's a number of things to be said about this, and we're going to be discussing that. I've got some very key people here today that's going to talk a little bit about that piece. And, um, and by the way, I might add also, too, that the legislature is going to be going in session in February, so they're going to be discussing, in fact, they're going to be discussing this, these issues and whatever, trying to figure out what's going to be the lay of the game, and the, et cetera. So uh, we've got some work to do, folks. And the bottom line is that, in many ways, our kids are not being educated. We've got problems here in the state of Oregon as, as it relates to education. We've got a big political presidential race that's running right now, and the politics of pros and the cons, et cetera, et cetera. We've got on and on and on. But in all due respect, please, let's focus on the coming year of our education system that we have here in the state of Oregon. Okay, with that, uh, that's what we're going to do. And joining me today, as you note, my old friend, as you note, uh, uh, to my left on the screen here, on the far the far left, would be Steve Buell. Steve, as you note, uh, he's, he was a former board member here in Portland Public Schools. He, he's been a teacher for years. He still is teaching, trying to teach me. <laughs> in many ways, but uh, but anyway, he's, he's toughest pupil. He's quite an edu He's got quite a background, and we've been spending quite a bit of time, if you will, just trying to figure out how to educate you about what's going on within our educational system. Okay, Steve, welcome aboard. Thank you. As usual, nice okay. to be here. Appreciate that. And now, with us joining us now, we're going to probably have a third person here with us now. Uh, besides, besides Steve and I, we, we've got Susan Barrett. You know, she's she's kind of the lead person behind Oregon Save Our School. And we get a feel for a better definition of what that's all about, Susan, as we go along. And then you'll probably be a permanent fixture of, uh, with us, you know, because uh, no, I didn't respect. realize that, okay. <laughs> well, well the, whole, the whole idea is that, you know, this is new, if you will, mm -hmm. this whole idea, this concept that the governor has brought up. Mm. And it's going to take work among us all. Right. And, uh, and that's why I'm so fortunate to have Steve with us here, because Portland actually is the largest school district we have in the state of Oregon. And this is very key that the public, the lay public, understand what is going on. Absolutely. And uh, a lot of times, you know, they, they sort of speak in different tongues, if you will, when you get down to the legislature. Mm -hmm. But we're going to try to make some sense of it, okay, at this point in time. So welcome aboard. Thank you. Okay, Thank good. You. Why don't we start off with you in regards to um, uh, maybe just educating the viewers as to what is the Oregon Save Our School program? What is that about? Sure. Uh, well, we're really a, we're not a program. We're a group of people that came together because okay. we were incredibly concerned about what we were seeing happening actually nationally, but um, with corporate more of corporate interests being mm -hmm. served right now in our public schools, more of the corporate interests having more of a voice in our public schools rather than the parents, the teachers, and the students. And a lot of the policies, including some of the ones we're probably going to talk about mm -hmm. today, are coming more from corporate interests rather than from those who are most impacted mm -hmm. by these decisions. Mm -hmm. And um, what really kind of brought us together was that um, I had been a member of Stanford Children, mm -hmm. I heard of them, and um, I wasn't super active until last school year. I'd been unemployed and I had some more time, some parents said, hey, why don't you, you know, take on this uh, leadership role, be the leader of our team. Mm -hmm. And so I did that, and I got to see more of what was going on behind the scenes. And I think Stanford Children has gone through some phases. I think they've had some changes. I personally still think they started out with a good intent, mm -hmm. um, but then just got co-opted mm -hmm. by more of the corporate interests, a lot of funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, mm -hmm. the Walton Family Foundation, that are pushing some things that aren't really in the best interest of public schools and our students. Mm -hmm. Um, so um, after doing a little more 
looking into Stanford children and then meeting with their um, local executive director, I decided, you know what, parents really need to know what is happening with Stanford children so they don't get sucked in and then try to push these policies. A lot of times you don't even know what policies they're really promoting. You might get some little synopsis and it might be right before they expect mm -hmm. you to go and talk to legislators. Mm -hmm. And I felt people really need to know about that. So I wrote a piece had my email on it and said, hey, if yeah. people in it's Oregon want to work on yeah. um, education in mm -hmm. Oregon, contact me. Mm -hmm. I think that's how Steve and I ended Good. up meeting Good. and Good. a few others. Plus, there was um, a teacher, there is a teacher, a bilingual education teacher out in mm -hmm. the Reynolds District, who at the same time was thinking the same thing. She wasn't involved in Stand for Children, but she mm -hmm. really was deeply concerned about more of these corporate interests, having more of a say in our schools than, again, those who are most directly impacted. And she wanted to do something about it, and we mm -hmm. hooked up with her. Yeah. and. Um, the Save Our Schools, we adopted uh, four core values mm -hmm. from the National Save Our Schools okay. movement. Okay. So there was that, did you hear about the big rally that happened in DC in July? Okay. Um, okay. And I think they're gonna try to make it bigger every year. And um, it was great. I actually went there, Emily and I, this, uh, this bilingual education teacher, and we decided when we came back here that, you know, to grow our group, we thought we would just adopt these four core values because they're very basic. It's mm -hmm. we want adequate, equitable, stable funding for all mm -hmm. public school communities. Okay. We want an end to high stakes testing mm -hmm. for the purposes of teacher, student, and school evaluations. That's high stakes testing. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. testing, all right, yeah, you know, yeah, but high stakes yeah, when yeah. we make um, important decisions on them, not, not so good. And that we really want to have more of that parent and teacher and community say in any educational policy decision making. And the same thing with the curriculum. Right now, so much of our curriculum is developed totally outside of our communities. Mm -hmm. And it isn't relevant to our students, mm -hmm. you know, so we want to have more of a say in that. Good. I take most of these parents uh, and our people of concern have kids in school. That's the whole idea in most, most cases. Oh, in our group? Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. We're a mix of teachers and parents. People are very yeah. concerned. So it's not you just, can a, go to Oregon. just an activist group. These, these are people that are seriously concerned about kids. Right? Oh, absolutely. And when yeah. I say group, oh, we're not. Yeah. Best, group of, best group of people mm -hmm. I've ever worked with. Really, right? They really care about kids. They're really on there. And they, they pay attention. And they know what they're talking about. And they, care, and they put kids first. You can go to mm -hmm. Oregon SOS on, the, okay. on Facebook. And okay. you can see we put a lot of stuff on that has to do with uh, what's the, what are different problems throughout the country. So actually. there's a major stake here involved here and, and a focus. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. You know, this is a very serious situation. It is a serious problem. Mm -hmm. You got me? And in fact, uh, just getting right into this whole issue of the Oregon Education mm -hmm. Investment Board aspect of it, mm -hmm. if I were to ask you, know, before I get Steve involved in this, <laughs> if I were to ask you and maybe part of the group, what do you all think about this whole business, about this new concept where the governor is going to be, i.e., chairman of the board, kind of like a, a school board, right. and then you've got the superintendent, this new special person who hasn't been hired yet, right? right? Right. Uh, what do you think about that? When that came on board, what do you think? Oh, yeah. So, and this is around the time when this legislation yeah, happened yeah. in the last session. Right. That, there were so many things that were uh, kind of red flags for me about Stanford Children. But when they started to push this, I thought, this is ridiculous. This is really taking our public voice away. Hmm. And so, you know, allowing the governor to sort of be the supreme being over mm -hmm. education, I mean, it. Is that that's not really what we want. I mean, the mm -hmm. public needs to have a say. And right now, so much has been going on that has been behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. And when they do have public meetings, there are at times when most people can't go to them. Mm -hmm. I went to some of the meetings early on when I was unemployed, mm -hmm. and a, a total eye opener to see some of what was going on. But most of these meetings happen between work hours. Many of them are out in Salem. Mm -hmm. And it's just a lot of details to follow. And we were fortunate enough, one of the uh, people in our group has been attending these meetings ever since it was the Oregon Education Investment Team. So mm -hmm. it started off as this team that was going to prepare all these documents to be handed over to the now board, which has just been appointed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think there are some, you know, some pretty decent people mm -hmm. on the board, and hopefully they will speak up and slow things down. Our biggest concern has been that there's just there's just a lot of sweeping changes that are being mm -hmm. proposed. As many have said, they're being looked at from the 30,000 foot level. Mm -hmm. Okay, at some point you gotta come down to the mm -hmm. ground and mm -hmm. really think through how is this actually gonna work? How mm -hmm. is this actually gonna impact the kids in our system? We also feel that so much emphasis is being placed on changing the system mm -hmm. 
not improving it, not mm -hmm. making it better for kids. You can change it all you want, but then mm -hmm. you lose, you can lose sight of the kids in the system. Tell me, were you able to, you're part of your group, were you, were you guys able to uh, actually have input were you in, in Salem at all? I went we, down to three of the good. four meetings of the board, but what about and, they, and they, let, they, they let you have three minutes. Oh, okay. Just kind of like going to the school board and Portland, the with no dialogue, you could talk for three no, minutes. With no, no there, and there's been no, there's been no uh, uh, large public meetings or mm -hmm. anything similar. They had four meetings, and I was there for three of them. The governor was there for three of them, by the way, which I thought was interesting. Mm -hmm. He was there three out of the four, same as me. Well, he's new so, he's but he, he left early. Oh, he met okay, a couple okay, of them okay, that he was okay, there. So okay, he, okay. you know, the whole idea of him running everything, he can't even kind of get to the meetings. It mm. makes it difficult. Mm. Well, Steve, who are some of the people on that on that, on that that board? Well, some people, as my understanding, some folks that we recognize that are from this area? Yeah, there's, there's uh, Ron Saxton is on the okay. board, and and Julia Brim Edwards. In fact, they're two Both of the, used to be on Portland Public both Schools. Both used to be on Portland Public Schools. Both board. had their hand in and were very instrumental in the inequities in Portland, which we've talked about, yeah. you and I, many times yeah. on the show. Uh, and actually, Ron Saxon, Saxon is in charge of the committee that's dealing with the educational compacts, which we'll talk about in a minute, which okay. are one of the main things. And Julia Brim Edwards is in charge of the committee that's deciding how to, to uh, select the, the, the new superintendent. The CEO, hmm. so, actually. So they're very, very powerful. Well, you know, and we both know them. We probably all know them. But uh, from my uh, my recollection and whatever, in terms of their involvement, they've been very, very much involved in the whole issue of Portland Public Schools. Oh, yeah. Ron Saxon even ran for governor at one point in time. Jerry, Julia Brim Edwards was on the board also, too, at Portland Public Schools. So they've got many, many hours, you know, looking at all these issues and whatever. Uh, is that an asset uh, to this group or what? I mean, well, the problem is, that, of course, that their their attitude is the opposite of our organization's attitude. Okay, okay. You know? I mean, they when they were in Portland Public Schools on the school board, they were right in with the group that was pushing what we've always called the big four schools, you know, the Lincoln, Wilson, Cleveland, and, and Grant schools, okay. to the detriment of every other school in the district. You know, that, they were there when it was all taking place. They were in charge of it, basically, and, and two of the most powerful board members. So, geez, I don't know, you have all this inequitable stuff in Portland that, that they created, now you send them down to, to be on the top board in Oregon as two of the most powerful people? We probably think they're two of the four most powerful people on the board. Hmm, hmm. And yet, so are we gonna have all this inequity in Oregon now? coming out of this. But well, can you talk a little bit more about Did you want to say Go ahead. Something? Yeah, I don't want to discount all the people who have currently been appointed right. to this okay. organization. No, there's some people who are, there's some people who we think are pretty sharp. Okay. Who are right. some of the and other folks? Anybody else? Anybody uh, there's else a right Dr. Right? Samuel Henry. From where? Where, 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 um, where he's, at, he's at PSU. PSU, okay. And um, he's done a lot in uh, early learning and okay. so forth. And, and, there's, and there's some other decent people on there. I think one of the biggest problems, though, is that there was this Oregon Education Investment Team, and there was a group of 30 people that was pulled together by the Oregon Business Council Council called LearnWorks to develop materials that would be given to the Oregon Education Investment Board. Mm -hmm. So they are just they're just coming on board and they're getting all these materials handed to them. Basically all this stuff that's been thought mm -hmm. through that hasn't had public input mm -hmm. and and now they're supposed to make these, you know, sort of sweeping changes in a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking about things that are going to be legislated in February, being put before the le before the legislature in February, they're obviously being written now. These achievement compacts that Steve mentioned, you know, that Ron Saxton is really pushing. I mean, that's something that's being written now. Mm -hmm. And this board is only just getting a chance to weigh in on that. So, and talk about, you know, inequities. I mean, achievement compacts when we're basing that on the achievement on standardized test scores, we've got some serious problems there. You know, so. as, as we think about this thing, when he was running for governor, John Kitzhop, this is his second term, term, time, if you will, there was, there was people that were talking to the frustration in our whole educational system for the entire state. You know, the problem, not only just from K-1 to K-12, but the universities, the, the whole nine yard Marianne routine. And supposedly out of that so-called, as I understood it, uh, he responded by saying, well, okay, fine, we don't need a state superintendent, you know, like Susan Castile, who's there. I guess it's, uh, so all of a sudden we won't have a Susan Castile. It'll all be under the governor's office. You know, the buck stops here, so to speak. 
and uh, his position has always been, well, this is, the, this is going to be the best thing. We're going to really get this thing down. Uh, one of the major concerns we've had here has always been dropouts, if you will, uh, failures. You know, Steve, we've talked about this many, many moons. And I guess when I, I'm, th I'm throwing it on the table, get you all to react to me <laughs> in terms of, uh, are we going to, is he going to be able to do this? Are we going to be able to no. do this? No. Why, he, Steve? He's, for one thing, they're going down the same path okay. that they've gone down before. The, the, there's, we, we've talked about the reform movement right. in, in education, and basically it's built around testing and teacher accountability and those things where you put all the time and energy into the adults or into the testing programs, and th they're not making changes there. And then they look and say, well, the the education has been bad for the last 10 years and 20 years in Portland, really. But the reason it's been bad is because we've been doing what the reform movement has suggested that mm -hmm. we should be doing. Mm -hmm. And now they're just saying, well, we'll do more of it. And, and they're saying, well, it's been bad, so now we're going to do more of what's made it bad in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that's, the, that's where they're going. They're not looking at the idea that the state used to go out and say, well, you need to have so much science, you need to have so much art, you need to have so much PE, you need to have these things, and this. that used to be the state's role. Now what they're saying is, we're going to set up a contract with each school district, 197 school districts, mm -hmm. we'll set up a contract with each one that says, in order to get your money from the state, mm -hmm. you're going to have to do certain things, and you're going to have to have to do basically things that we want you to do. And one of the things they want you to do is testing teacher accountability. Now, some of it's coming out of the No Child Left Behind, right. where they have a new system coming out where they have you can get a waiver to the No Child yeah, Left Behind. He indicates that he's going to do that. Right, right. And, the, and the waiver, but in the waiver it says you have to have a program of teacher accountability. And part of that program in the waiver says that you need to essentially evaluate teachers based on the test scores of the mm -hmm. kids, which we're totally opposed to because mm -hmm. it's just mm -hmm. totally crazed, mm -hmm. really. Yeah, and actually, I mean, it's interesting. When you look at, um, you know, as Steve mentioned, you know, some, they're just trying to do what's already been proven to not work. Mm -hmm. You know, no child left behind, when you look at it in the high stakes testing, it has actually led to an increase in dropouts and pushouts mm -hmm. in our schools. Mm -hmm. So why on earth would we want to keep going down that same path? Um, you know, kids want curriculum that is engaging, that is incredibly relevant, and, um, you know, it, it speaks to them. Mm -hmm. And teachers want to teach that way mm -hmm. for the most part. And so um, to just, you know, have put so much emphasis on these high stakes tests is just, it's just ridiculous. So we need to change that. Okay. You know, one of the things I would like to think about is regards to. Um, uh, their, their focus on this, my understanding, like thinking about the Portland Public Schools or any other school around the state, if all of a sudden there's a failure, they're not meeting those contract goals and this, that, and the other, suppose there's a special team that will go to that particular go district and, and say, okay, out. fine, well, okay, well, look, you're not doing anything, We may what we may do, what are you going to do, fire teachers or well, what are you going to do, fire the school board or not give any money, what's up? Well, it's actually interesting, in this LearnWorks <laughs> report that, that came out, so again, these 30 yes. people were um, brought together by the Oregon Business Council and yes. they spent 3,000 hours, as they talk about it, in August coming up with this plan. Oregon we looked at, here, local here in Portland? Yes, yes. Okay, and it's the plan that's informing now this Oregon Education right. Investment Board. Okay. And wow, when we read some of these slides, it was amazing. Um, what they propose doing is they actually don't refer to schools as schools, they're called delivery entities in this model. And so for delivery entities that are making progress, mm -hmm. you get access to grants. Mm. So you get more funding. So if mm. you're making progress, you get access to more funding. If you are not making progress, and again, progress at this point is based on high stakes mm -hmm. tests. If you are not making progress, there's these four different uh, levels that you go through. Um, so they'll bring in these outside entities to help you. Um, and uh, oh, I forget all the different things you have to go through. It's basically no but child left behind. In, it ends in receivership. It ends in receivership, hmm. which they don't define, but it's, hmm. what does well, that turning mean? Over a school. Do, do they bring in charters again? Maybe charter uh, yeah, schools maybe. or something? Maybe I mean, turn you know, into charge. Who knows? Well, what's the deal? It's and, who knows. Yeah. They haven't had any real discussions in the public. You can't really dialogue with people. Even people like Ben Cannon, who's a right. you know, well, ben, he's very oh, active, he's very, very active, active, really smart guy. They won't even he won't even finish a conversation with you that you have. I tried to have a conversation with ben? about Ron. Yeah, he won't even finish. It's the same government deal where we're really not going to talk to the 
people who are critical of this, hmm. not in any meaningful way. We're not going to allow the people who talk to have dialogue, back and forth dialogue, which we've talked about year, well, do years. Do you think the legislature is going to be able to do this, or what? Are they going to be able to deal with the? But that's what they're being to say. That they're going to be having a, a session, if you will, for the month of February. Yeah. Can reconvening to talk about this issue. Well, it's this pretty fast. Stuff. Here's the here's the report, 54 Jeez. pages, wow. and it, and it's laid out, small print. It's wow. really small. How can you print. access this? Can you access this on the on the, oh, on the net? You can, yeah, mm -hmm. you can access it on the net. But it's there's a lot of detail in here, wow. and none of it sounds too bad, hardly, unless you're really educated in mm. how it all works. Mm. Mm. You know, and that's part of the problem. How many legislators really understand the problems of high stakes testing? How many legislators understand how when when the government Oregon government does something with the schools mm -hmm. how the schools take it and corrupt it and they do all the time I mean the high stakes testing has been terribly corrupted uh, you, I have a nephew and he I asked him about his school the other day and he talked about oh I didn't pass my tests you know and I said well yeah, okay, okay that's not a, too much of a problem what do you, how much science are you doing well hardly any he's in the fifth grade how much social studies are you doing? Well, we had a little bit of social studies. It, so the testing has taken over hmm. that kid's education. And guess what? It's not a very fun education for him. And it's not a very valuable education. Learning how to answer questions about reading is not really the most valuable education you can have. You know, it's one of the things that Steve and I had discussed for many times mm -hmm. over here, especially for Portland Public Schools, is that in the early days when D. Bernard, Dr. D. Bernard has put together the community colleges mm -hmm. or whatever, it was it, there was a deal where it's such that voc ed was taken out of Portland mm. public schools. Yeah, that's right. And a lot of these kids are dependent upon that. A lot of them don't have, if you will, lawyer dads and this, that, and the other, and you know, professional folks. So they need something, if you will, to motivate them, if you mm -hmm. will. And so we we talked about this for quite some time, and that's a concern here in the in the, the largest school district in the state of where we don't have voc ed. I everything don't. around yeah. everything around the, the Portland public schools have have voc ed. But I, not here. I don't it, think it, well, yeah. if you go out now, they're taking out uh, almost every place. Uh, well, they're taking out not just that, but so, yeah, but so many other things. Yeah, yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Music, art, libraries. Home I mean, ed, all that kind of stuff. All, all that of the stuff things. that's sort of across the board. You, you yeah. go into schools now and you can have a academic, uh, you can have a, a academic coach, they call it, a teacher, often their best teacher they've taken out of the classroom, make her, him or her an academic coach. She's supposed to coach the other teachers. Right. And... What she's coaching on, or he's coaching on, is to do better on the test, how you do better on the yeah, test. Yeah. But that school might not even have a librarian. I mean, which is way more powerful. A li good library is way more powerful in getting kids to become good readers than answering a whole lot of questions. You know, on the you, know test. you brought up a little good little point I'm thinking about just here locally. Uh, there was an article with, with, Rand, with reference to Randy uh, at uh, City Council, person, and understand the fire bureau, if mm. you will. I guess one of their people was taking the the chief's test or something, one of the tests, if you will, and one of the principal people gave him the test. And so now there's an investigation. I'm, I'm just thinking about the testing thing. Everything's mm. on a test routine. You got me? Yeah, and, and the other thing about that, too, is what we measure, Yes. is that saying that that's what we value. Right. And so if we're measuring math scores and reading scores and occasionally yes. uh, science scores, right then that's where all the emphasis goes. Okay. That's where we're putting our funding. So mm -hmm. right now, in addition to these achievement compacts, um, they're talking about outcomes-based budgeting. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna put money into outcomes, outcomes based outcomes. on mm. uh, these test mm. scores. Mm. And, so the concern better, would be, and the concern would be? Well, gonna, the concern would be, well, you're not gonna get the voc ed, you're okay, not gonna get okay. the music, the art, the yes. libraries, okay. because none of that's gonna show up in any of these tests. We're not gonna see an outcome from that, mm -hmm. when it has been proven that if you give kids increased access to books, mm -hmm. that has tremendous value and a mm -hmm. tremendous impact on the reading scores. Oh, sure. You know, another point, I mean, we've talked about that before, too, in that uh, I noticed Ron Herndon, you know, he happens to be the mm -hmm. president of Head Start nationally, mm -hmm. and yet he's writing articles in the Portland Observer newspaper. And I would have thought that consideration would have been given, if you will, to having the national person for Head Start sitting on that committee. Well, you the, thought? the interesting thing <laughs> to me about that committee is, Talk to me. is that the, the governor wants that committee event essentially to run everything from early childhood right. all the way right, right. Through, all the way to, college, through, through college, including yes. community college. Right. Well, the people in that committee are not 
experts in those things necessarily. Mm. Like if you put me on that committee, yeah, I'm an expert in K-12. Yeah, I've done background. as much. You've i got, got background. background. Right. Yeah. But what do I know about community college? Mm -hmm. Well, my nephew went oh, wow. for a couple wow. t wow. couple of years. You mean there's no one you know? there? On and that I, I don't know, but what I'm saying is that they, they've chosen different people, right. but they don't have people who really have that idea of they have somebody from the community college, but what does he or okay. she know about K-12? What does... Uh, does the K-12 superintendent really know about how the early childhood mm -hmm. preschool mm -hmm. stuff works, the, 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 uh, all the stuff for four-year-olds? She's not in charge of that. Mm -hmm. And so you've got this committee, where, whereas you used to have people who were centered on it. For instance, if you had the, the higher education committee, they at all have ideas about what goes on right, in college. Right, right. And that's what they centered on. They didn't do the K-12. Now you've got this and a mishmash of people. And well, you know, obviously, and, and, they, and they're not experts at all. They're right, no better right. than a guy off the street at right. say what's happening in K twelve right, or right. what's happening in, in higher education or something. I don't well, know. Well, we agree. Education. They're all on a fast track. Mm -hmm. This is a fast track. Oh, geez. You know, and, and fortunately, Lightning. you know, they got, the legislature is going to meet in February to discuss this issue, and hopefully, people like yourselves will have the opportunity, mm -hmm. if you will, to be able to go before various committees. I'm sure that they're going to probably form various committees. In, as far as legislators are concerned, and get these hearings so people like yourselves could come before that group and be given the opportunity to articulate the positions that you're taking at this point in time. I think it's very, very important. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I got to give him a little kudos from, well, not necessarily a kudos, but you notice know, he just, well, he just fired the uh, president of OSU, right? Oregon State or, or University. Oregon. You know, because Oregon. he basically, well, he just sort of like forgot about the issue we were in the recession, gave everybody raises and whatever. I mean, people had some problems with that. Everybody's having some tough times. But I guess my point is that we are on a fast track on this situation, and, and it's good that we have this show, if you will, that hopefully we'll use this as a format mm -hmm. to educate not only just the people, but the legislators too. Get this to the governor's office. We're going to probably get a copy of this, and I'm going to send this over to him. Give it to Tim Raphael and let him let him hear the comments and whatever, because it's going to take us all to work this thing out. Because at the end of the day, it's about the kids. It's about right. the education of our kids here in the state of Oregon. It's very, very important. And so that's why I really appreciate the fact that Stevie on it, and you brought Susan on here. And what we're going to do is probably bring some other players and maybe have our own little session, and we can get this show, get this in the front of them. We'll send them copies and give them the email address. We'll email them the show and, and let them see it. We're on YouTube, and so consequently, there's no reason why they can't see the show, right, and see what's going on. So I would, I would suggest that why don't we, I take it you are going to be down in the, in, at the legislature come February, right? You got to go to some of these. Oh, sure. well, yeah, we've been trying to make it to as many as we, we basically there is always we've covered at least all a few the meetings so far. Yeah, going yeah, to okay. all the Somebody, meetings. Yeah. Well, that's good. We have we have the problem that most of the public has. And right. Thankfully, we have Steve, who's you know retired, retired right now. Yeah. Um, and when we've had some people who've been unemployed, we have right, more people right, that right, can right, go right, to these right, meetings. Right, right. It's tough because they happen during the workday. Well, now we have the Voters Digest on it now. Mm -hmm. so there you go. We got the Voters <laughs> Digest, and when you have your meetings now, maybe in the future, we may want to quote. I'll have my crew come over mm -hmm. and give the other women and folks that are involved with the opportunity to articulate their position, and then we'll get it to those folks, both the legislators and the governor. Is that fair, Steve? Well, that's always fair. Okay, good. So why don't we say that we, we'll set something up for February? You know, give it a couple weeks or so in February with the session. You, if you all got the information, you'll come back on the show, and then you'll basically give us a kind of an over, you know. How it's going? Yeah, exactly what's going on. Okay, does that sound good? Yeah, yeah. I'd be glad. are you all right? You okay, I think Susan? you need to keep talking about it now because people need to be educated oh, we about do. it. Yeah, I, oh yeah, we're gonna do it. No, we're gonna do it. <laughs> Decisions Let's say, are happening. Yeah, so Bruce is going right? on vacation. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, well, so what, but what we can do, we can say we can do something first part of February, and then let people know about the schedule, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Maybe arrange opportunities for maybe buses or transportation it's, to get down to the legislature. I went down and testified on another bill last year. And I testified to the education. It was okay. the Senate Education Committee. And I was the only guy who testified against the bill. That's part of the problem. A lot of people don't understand right, how right, this all works. Right, exactly. I testified against this bill that had the teacher accountability stuff. Right, right. And every other major organization that was an education organization in the entire state of Oregon, basically, right, right, was right. testifying for the bill. Right. I mean, it's... I think it's going to go myself. Okay, okay. Why don't we do this? I was just thinking about this. I am going to be off on the month of, month of January, but let's say the fourth, mm -hmm. the fourth week in January, the fourth Sunday in January, we'll come back to the table 
and then we'll kind of prepare folks about the fact that, hey, these are the dates they're going to be having, blah, blah, blah. I'm sure they'll, the committees will have probably been already set up, and they'll probably lay out the schedule in terms of the February meeting of the legislature. Is that fair? So the fourth... Yeah, we can get somebody to come back, even right. if I'm out of so, town. Even if okay, right. So the, fourth, so the fourth Sunday in January, mm -hmm. so prepare yourselves to bring some other folks with you or whatever. We'll set something up. And we'll do it right here on the Oregon Voters Digest. And like I said, the purpose is to get that to the legislature. So if some folks who can't go, we'll come back, we'll do some reporting and whatever. But we'll also communicate to the legislature and to the governor as to what are the concerns of citizens who won't be able to maybe go down to the legislature or if we may not as be as articulate. If we, a lot of times people get freeze up, they freeze up in the front of a mic or whatever. But they've got some concern. They've got their kids to worry about. And we, we're concerned about their kids too, and that's what this group's all about, okay? Folks, it's been a pleasure. This is great. We're here now. We got a team. Susan, Steve, and Bruce. <laughs> BES, right? <laughs> so, <that's the> <laughs> Folks, thank you very much. Appreciate thank it. You. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Thanks for being on the team. Steve, always a pleasure. Yeah. Again, take care, folks. Back. Happy holidays to you. And I'll be we got a we got another session right after this. We'll take a short break and we'll be right back. Thanks. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Oh, no, not that one. Just go up there over here, the, the photo right here. Give me that photo. There you go, right up there. I just want to show you folks a, a photo of a young lady that's going to be running for city council position number one. Okay? Her name is Teresa Rateford. That's right. Right, How Teresa Rateford. Make the process more efficient. Boy, I tell you, that's a quite of a headline. And that, by the way, appears in Street Roots. I think that's the, the November 11th issue of Street Roots. And I think it's very, very important. We get, we get right right into the election year, uh, beginning the first of the year. March is the deadline, if you will, for filing for anything, for that matter. And, and so I would say to you that it's going to be very much important for us to, you know, we are a voter state, uh, and, you know, uh, by mail, if you will, and it's going to be very, very important that you, we get a good background of all the individuals that are running. We're, we're living in some very serious times, That's very right. stressful times, if you will. And so we're going to get, we are in need to make sure that we, we get the best leadership within within our communities across the board, across the state for that matter, yes, across the country for that matter. That's We're all discussing it, right? <laughs> I mean, I know there's a priority with the with the presidential race right now, and, and the tubes are just pretty well filled, if you will, between the R's and the D's, the Republicans and the Democrats fighting one another uh, right. from that end of it. But the fact of the matter is we got issues here in Oregon, and in fact, better yet, we got major issues here in the, in the largest city in the state of Oregon, and I'm talking about the city of Portland. And the city commission, if you will, the city council is a very important entity, and, and we're always looking for good, good people. And uh, I recognize that the number of folks are going to be running. I mean, it just so happened I have one of the one, one of the one, one of the individuals who I th I feel is is is, a, is, a, is of a leadership capacity. Uh, she's been a she she's been a resident of Portland and from a historical standpoint uh, in the past, and she's been around here, and she's back. She want to be involved. She's gotten involved. She's got relatives here, and the whole like and. And I like a person that gets out and knocks on doors, and, I, right. and I like that idea. Okay, Teresa, welcome. 
Thank you. Appreciate that very much that you're here today with us. Well, I appreciate you having me. Thank you. Well, hey, thank you very much. Well, look, let's just get right down to business here. You know, uh, first off, why, why did you pick the city council to run? Well, why the uh, city council? Well, they're, they're the ones that direct policy in the city. They come up with the different ideas for funding, different projects and programs that help with our economy, mm -hmm. as well as with the educational component, which is what you were just talking about. And so uh, in, the, in the months leading up to my decision to make you know, a, a run for pro political office, uh, a lot of what I was dealing with was you can, you can become engaged as a community mm -hmm. because of your interest as a concerned citizen, but you can't hold them accountable to implementing those strategies that you discuss with them. A lot of people in the community, they say, well, I had some ideas. I, I challenged them to put my ideas to work, but they used the ideas and they still didn't work for me. And so one of the things that I thought might work is going in there and, and sitting at the table with them to discuss how to make those things work for the people, not to just use the ideas to obtain funding, but to use those ideas to help maintain livability for mm -hmm. the general public. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Well, you know, one of the things about running for office, like anything else, you know, uh, uh, is that um, a lot of times there are many issues. There are many issues, whether it be fire, whether they be police, whether it be education, whether whether it be whether it be homeless, a number of this, that, and the other. Well, normally most candidates, and I, I've talked with you about this, most candidates they they got to be focused on something that they feel good and comfortable with that they can talk about because that's what the that's what the viewing public, that's what the voting public wants to know. Can you and do you understand uh, something about the city that would be of benefit to me, the voter, if you will, and to and to all of us? And then the rest of it, in all due respect, is. OJT, on-the-job training. That's right. <laughs> because in all due respect, you don't see the incumbents or anybody else calling you to the table telling you what the, what the real issues are behind doors, right? That's so right. So you've got to do, basically, you got to do your research, you got to get out there and knock on some doors and whatever, and it's my understanding you've done just that, and there's a, there's a, there's a platform, there's an issue that you are, you are focusing on. What is that issue? Well, there's actually three of them. Three of them, uh, okay. Economics, education, and public safety. Let's take them right down the way there. Ed well, Start with economics. Well, with ed economics, uh, we, we know that there's a lot of unemployment here. We know that there's a, a rise in the homelessness here in Portland. And I was looking at the way that we're structuring our 25-year plan and some of the things that we're doing to attract business from outside the city and to grow and, and become more progressive. And one of the things that I was looking at is how are we going to implement the people that are currently here and those strategies so that they can do better for themselves as opposed to being so bright and beautiful to the people that don't live in Portland now. Mm -hmm. uh, we can engage with outside you know, states and different people across the nation and companies and everything else. Mm -hmm. But if we don't take care of the natives that live here, then we're not doing them the service. How do you think we should do that? How, how do we do that specifically? Well, we, we acknowledge that they need the information that we're okay. providing to everybody else. I was talking to a couple of people that live over in the Alberta neighborhood and they were talking about when the urban renewal came into the community, they didn't know about the resources that were mm. available to them as homeowners. Uh, they didn't know about the community planning meetings. They didn't have access to the contractors and mm. the developers or even the funding. But there's people that were in South Carolina that did have that information. Mm. And so uh, one of the things that we need to do is we need to do community planning with citizens that are here. We need to acknowledge and promote knowledge and resources to the citizens that are actually here in the city, uh, we were. I was just listening to what you were talking about with the people that were here in the panel talking about education, and they're going down to legislation, and they're the only ones there with their format and their views. Well, that seems to be a big disconnect. That means there's a lack of communication again mm -hmm. with the citizens of the cities in the state world. You know, uh, statewide. Um, I hadn't heard about that charter project until I spoke to you about it, mm -hmm. and I thought that I was in the know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so so we, we really do need to grab a handle on our communication and make sure that it's relevant to the people that live here. They pay taxes. Right. We're making decisions without right. their acknowledgement. Right. And we need to be better at that. Okay. You talked about education as one of the, one of the three uh, items. What, what, what about the education issue? Well, I agree with you on their vocational education components. When I grew up in Portland, we were going to driver's ed, and we learned how to build the cars, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you, could, you could learn about home economics, and mm -hmm. it wasn't just how to cook. It was also how to pay your bills and how to establish, you know, different contracts and, and partnerships. We learned about broadcasting, and all of those were different ideas of things that we were interested in doing, but they also took you to a career path. 
And so that's where I think that a vocational education can help somebody that's not into just wanting to be a lawyer or a doctor. Mm -hmm. They might be able to perceive what they want to be based on the opportunity to learn more mm -hmm. about a different type of industry, carpentry and painting and things mm -hmm. of that sort mm -hmm. with the green theme attached to it because we are in Portland and we're looking at eco-friendly opportunities. I think that that's just a broad and progressive way to bring that as an educational factor to our children. Mm -hmm. Even with the technology that we have, there's so many different things that we can do creatively mm -hmm. to use that type of format to educate our children here. Any and ideas? And not that you want to give everything out to the your, well, no, your because opponents, they said but I any should ideas the, about the education Well, they said I should get the position first. <laughs> that, oh, oh. One, yeah, I mean, one of the yeah. things that I, that I had been saying early on was that companies like Nike and uh, Willamette Industries mm -hmm. and Tillamook that I didn't understand why we didn't have curriculums in the boys and girls clubs, mm. you know, to promote what, you know, graphic designers do and mm. how to be in that, that okay. type of industry. Or even manufacturing like what they do in Tillamook. All of those are major brands mm -hmm. that make a lot of money and they bring a lot of value to the state. But our children and the people that live here, their only attachment is as consumers. But I think that we can start, by and large, promoting those as capable curriculums, you know. Okay, okay, good, good, good. Yeah, well, now, good. let's talk a little bit about that third plan. What's the other third area that you... Uh, were? Public safety. Public safety, yes, okay. Sir. That is a major piece, boy. It I tell is. you, people are concerned, you know. Right. Okay. Well, they don't feel safe. We, you know, we've been having these hearings over there at City Hall. Last five hearings were on police accountability. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the citizens are not feeling safe in their communities. And then, again, they have the other factor of feeling that they're being hindered with safety because of the control and force of the Portland Police Department. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're going, I went to the hearing and I heard a lot of people from the Occupy movement speaking about, you know, being barred and being hurt and brutalized and things of that sort. And I said, well, I hope that we don't lose the understanding that this is a citywide issue. It's not just the people that are in Occupy that feel like there's a, a lack of police accountability when it comes to their safety. But you have the mental health issues with the people in that arena that are being, uh, you know, th that have issues with it. And then I go to these gang task force meetings and we're talking about this big gang problem that we have here. And you, you hear them say, well, we have 119 unsolved homicides. Why aren't people talking to the police about what we can do about it? Why aren't people turning people in? Well, if you have a citizenship that is afraid of the local police, they're not going to go to you for safe and protection. They're going to only use you for control and force, mm -hmm. and that's used against them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think that we need to, you know, if the CRC and the Independent Police Review believe that they can help us create a more uh, accountable system mm -hmm. as opposed to what we have currently, I think that we need to look at making that happen because maybe we can solve some of the crimes that are out there now and some of the other issues we have. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question here. I, I, you know, the Occupy Portland thing of late, you know, was sort of a big issue here. Still, is an issue for that matter. And that was hopefully it started out. We, first, we got the, the blast about the Wall Street piece, and then it came to Portland, and then it was the Occupy, you know, the Occupy Portland aspect of it. But there was an area there that after we went through that whole process, uh, some some of the entities got a permit to march and IE and, and locate or whatever, and then others didn't. What do you feel about that? Which side of the which side of the coin do you go on? Or do you compromise? Well, I, I know that when talking with them, they say that they've been co-opted, and I guess that co -opted means co-opted. What do you mean? That I'm trying to figure that out. Oh, too. oh Is you that are like too? a half of a sellout or something yeah, yeah, like right. that. Should Would they be? have a permit? Well, they should have a permit. I okay. think that we follow the rules of engagement right. to make things uh, happen. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how you create a resolution. You figure out, you know, this is what our problem is. What do we need to do to solve mm -hmm. it? And you follow those rules of engagement so that you're not deterred from getting your resolution, you know. So, so that's it. So I mean, you, you go along with the line of the fact that they need to have a permit. They need to have a they permit. If, have a if permit. it's necessary, if it's the legal thing, I just go by. As long as it's legit. As long as it's legit. Yeah, if, right. you, if you need the permit in order to do what you're doing, just go ahead and apply for the permit so that okay. you can do it. And they can't say anything to you except for to look at your Because as you know, it's, it's public property, i.e. public, the taxpayers, right? That's and, right. And who's paying the bill, if you will, for cleanup or anything of that nature. And even, in fact, even even law enforcement for that. Maybe they they, they got to pick up that tab. I mean, I don't know if, if you notice the numbers that we had that, that came up with in regards to the police, when the police got involved, I mean, it, it's been, it's like millions of dollars that were spent on well, that whole issue. Got me? Right, but if it's the taxpayers' money and it's the taxpayers that are out there protesting, then that's our bill that we're paying. 
correct? Yeah, but, not, but in some cases, though, if, if the taxpayer is protesting without a commit permit, then they got to be exactly. they got to pay the whole bill. That's why you do the rules of engagement. <laughs> <laughs> if it says get the permit, get it, and you, you know you worry about that's things right, later right. on. But just well, protect yourself by by dealing with things the way that they are. Right. And what what other areas you think might be of interest to? To the, to the neighborhoods and to people in Portland, the Portland voter for that matter. What about senior citizens? Uh, uh, you know, what about parents and, and what about small business? Why should they, why should they vote for you? Because I'm promoting knowledge, resource, and resolution. Knowledge, resource, and resolution. Absolutely, okay. that's the platform. Uh, when, when we're talking to people, a lot of the things that hinder their progress in whatever it is, if it's social security or if it's senior citizens trying to get access to information, a lot of people are working through these programs and these different agencies and they hit a brick wall where there's no support and they say well I've done everything that I'm supposed to do they're following the rules of engagement mm -hmm. but they're not getting a basic resolution to their problems so they feel like they're dead in and a lot of people keep saying well this city doesn't work and nothing is working for me and they're not telling me enough information and I think again when you promote the knowledge and access and how to access resources then you have you know, a fortified situation at that point. You have people that know how to go from point A to point B to get to point C. Right now, they don't. You might call a line where you need to get access to food, and if that line is busy, you know, you don't get anybody on the other end, and you don't know anybody else that can get it for you. Um, I had a meeting this morning, and I was talking with Barbara O'Hare, and she was listing all of the different agencies and organizations that she sits on the board with. Mm -hmm. And I'm listening to her like, wow, I sit on the board with at least two of those agencies that me and you are both on. I get your emails and correspondence, but I had no idea that you were working with the foster children. I had no idea that you were working with the educational system. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. She would be a perfect go-to person for you know, a handful of problems that I know people that have them. But I didn't even know that, and we sit and, and drink tea together. Hmm. So, I, so what I'm hearing you saying is that that's going to be one of the areas you, in, 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 in that you're going to be concerned with and interested in if and when you're on the city council, and that is to communicate to the public about all these various venues, right? That's exactly where to right, go. where to go. And guess uh, where you can do that most most effective? The Oregon Voters Digest or PCM, Portland absolutely. Cable Medium. As you note, um, we are a public entity, you know what I'm saying, in all due respect. This is public. This is public television. That's right. The little people who are not on the major networks and whatever to voice their opinions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, in and, and all due respect, hopefully you will be supporting this. If you're a city council person, will you be supporting PCM? Because it, they, they basically take, they're the caretakers of the funding. Is that something that you might be uh, feeling comfortable with? Huh? Absolutely. We need Portland. You know, we need Portland broadcasting. Okay. We need to have it free. We need to have people be able to use their voices and promote their views because with our current media yeah, and right. I've said it before is it's sort of a biased view mm -hmm. you get what is uh, attached to a political agenda or a corporate agenda and it might not be the full information that you need mm -hmm. you know so so you don't find success in getting what you need out of it um, this format here this forum here I can come here and start my own show yes, and yes, let everybody yes, know exactly yes. what I think and how I feel right, about it right with evidence or without it, but mm -hmm. I can substantiate my views and to a public arena. If we don't have that anymore, I don't know what we're going to expect from people. Well, I appreciate what you said because too often people tend not to understand what PCM or Portland Cable Medium is all about. Because in all due respect, if you, if you, are, a, if you are a public, if you are an individual and you're a citizen of Portland, you can come here and qualify yourself to have a show like I, like we're doing right here, okay? Right. And as long as it, long as it's a, it's above board, if you will, and it, it's nothing. There's no profanities and this, that, and the other, and the negatives and this, that, and the other. But facts and this, that, and the other, and community, you can do the show. Sometimes it, I think it's a, it's a better way of doing things as opposed to having somebody on a soapbox or out yelling at somebody, this, that, and the other, or frustrated. That's this right. is a medium. Whether you like it or not, the fact of the matter is, we're all citizens. We're all here as community. And we all have varying backgrounds. That's right. Uh, you know, we are we are creatures of our exposure, something like that, right? That's Fair? right. Okay. So, <laughs> any any other little any other little point any other points you think you might want to make in regards to why should voters be voting for you come come um, uh, voting day? What do you think? Well, I, I think that it's time for us to have people from the community. Uh, it's past time for the general public to become political. And so occupying City Hall is a way to, to show by example that, I need, that we need to be in there. Um, 
you know, it's kind of hard to answer that question. Well, that's okay. Well, I'll, I'll just ask you in, in another way. You know, in all yeah. due respect, the last African American we had on city council was a gentleman by the name of Dick Bogle. Right. Yeah, unfortunately, he's passed away now. But Dick was the last person of color that was on the uh, the city council. We've not had a Hispanic on there as of yet, but uh, we've not had a black since. Uh, for, for, and prior to Dick Bogle was uh, was Commissioner Charles Jordan. Commissioner Jordan happens to be a neighbor of mine, but you know he was a very popular person. I know. And in fact, like Dick was too. His, his mother Catherine Bogle was was a very prominent person here. In fact. Uh, when uh, we, my wife and I used to own the Portland Observer newspaper, uh, Catherine used to be a reporter, mm. and she was a very beautiful person, and she was very she covered everything for that matter. She was good. So again, that, that there's history here making, if you will. Exactly. And there's never been a an African American woman on city council. Well, on Portland City Council. It's you about I mean? time. Yeah, I mean, so I'm just I'm just giving you some history here, and how important you're just running for office for that matter. You know, in all due respect, I would encourage you, uh, you know, sometimes you can win by losing. I, my thing is that you may not be the first time, but you, hey, you go on there and you do it again. You I go mean, on there with your integrity. You just focus you trying to, you, you just do what you have to do. Yeah. So it's a very, very important piece that, that if, in fact, you were successful in, in becoming, I think that would be very important uh, because of your history uh, and with the community and this, that, and the other. We've got a lot of young people that are frustrated out here. Uh, folks are concerned about, i.e., young black gang members, if you will. But, you know, I, I came from one gang member, it was called Marine Corps. We were green, <laughs> see what I'm saying? So, but the bottom line is that young people are looking for a way out, and, and, and that's something we need, a, we need a solution to the problem. We need a level playing field. We definitely we need, do. We need to... Education is very is key right. to this issue. Uh, parents need to be more involved, if you will. As you know, we've gone through an era where excuse me, for babies were having babies, mm -hmm. and mom was having, they were having some tough times. So, so you got, it's, a, it's a big job. You it's, know? A, it's a big job, and, and one of the things that made me want to, to take the seat for neighborhood involvement position right. one is because there's a lot of people that say, we're doing this for you, we're doing this for you. Mm -hmm. But until we have people from the community or mm -hmm. from the city that can sit down at the panel and, and be a part of the legislation, be a part of City Hall, and do it for themselves and show that attachment to the other people in the community, then it's not going to be enough to have a handout. You mm -hmm. have to have the opportunity to accept a hand up. Mm -hmm. And I believe that with my business background and being able to know everybody, I know the city. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the city. I, I have friends of all various ethnicities in all different parts of Southeast, Southwest, Northeast, Northwest. And, um, and and nobody is communicating anymore mm -hmm. like they should, but I know that me being a part of them creates a nucleus. Mm -hmm. And with us going into City Hall together with those new views, being a part of the new establishment and helping us into our 25-year plan, mm -hmm. I think it's a necessity and mm -hmm. it's progressive. Okay. Okay. And it only makes sense to me. Okay, let me ask you another question. I mean, I'm giving you a little political thing to get a yes, sense sir. of, from the voter standpoint of how you feel and how you think about certain things. What do you think about them eliminating the Fairless Square for TriMet well, downtown? I, what do you think about that? Well, I, I think How that's, you feel about I that? don't think it's a good business decision, really. Not, uh, really? I don't think Why is that that? it's a Why good business that? decision. Because there's progressive things that they can do to keep it here. Okay. Uh, the Fairless Square, right now, you go to the TriMet stations and you're sitting there, and they should pay me for this comment. But <laughs> okay. you, you go there, you're stepping on the uh, bus stop, and the only advertisements you see are on the train as they go by. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm thinking that if there's a money issue for why they want to start charging for the Fairless Square, that they can use the advertising opportunity to offset that issue. You can be sitting at Fairless Square, and as the schedule is passing by, you can see advertisement, or it could be advertisement at the bus stop where they can make sure that there's a rack there that has someone's catalog. Oh, gonna, I would uh, shop at Nordstrom sitting at the bus stop do if you I plan, was. Do you plan to share your comments with the director of uh, TriMet? Absolutely. If you would like to listen to it, I've shared them in Street Roots, actually. All right. Okay. 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 <laughs> now, what about, give me another little piece. we got a little minute or two, because people want to know just kind of like what your positions are, if you will. What do you think about bicycling in the city of Portland? Well, I love a bike. You like a bike? <laughs> I like bikes. But you know, I, the one thing that comes around, so I'm at that age factor now, and aspect of it, and Tom and some of the guys that are here on my crew, we're trying to figure out how do we ride a bike? I mean, we need to ride around, too. I mean, you start your own bikers club. Yeah, but, but I mean, I, are, you gonna have, are we going to have, a, would you support a tri-bike? 
bike, so to speak. A tri bike. You're yeah, talking yeah. about like a trimet operating no, bike. You know, like a, like a, like a oh, tri bike with three wheels on for it. The geriatrics. Can we do that? Can, can, <laughs> would you support something like that? I mean, we Tom have would, them. Tom would love that piece. Where's other Tom? folks, other seniors, you know, because we are at a point, you know, we we, we are in a baby boomers type situation, <clears> and. Uh, in all due respect, a lot of folks are retiring and we're older. We'd like to get out of our homes and whatever. And we, too, would like to get out and ride the bikes. Not doing the winter weather and just that and the other, but doing good weather. What do you think about that? What about our bike path? Should it be bigger? Maybe we should take a bigger well, street. As Tom, far Tom, as Tom, the, what yeah, do you as think far about as the, that? The bike paths and everything like that, I know that there's a lot of public safety issues with that because okay. they've thrown bike paths in places okay. where it's not engineering. The engineering portion okay. of it is not as valuable as the safety to the people. Uh, where they're being placed, but as far as uh, the biking and the seniors and the tri bike and all that, I what think it's that? good like exercise. That? Is that a good idea? You think it's <laughs> something you promote? Think, I think it would be something uh, I would promote, and I think that one of the ways we could promote it is we can use it to help bring awareness to some of the things that people aren't knowledgeable yeah, about. We got quite a, we got a quite a, a sizable senior citizen community. That's here. right, and they need to get out of their homes. They right? need to get out of safely. their homes, and they need to be able to get out safely, and right? they need to have something to go and do. Okay, you know, so I mean. A Along with that knowledge resource resolution platform, let's get them out there and let's let people know about the whole bike riding aspect. Mm -hmm. when, I mean, we had this issue. My friend Donna was doing race talks, mm -hmm. and one of the things that came up was the bike issue on Williams Avenue. And, and they had these articles that said black people don't like bikes, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, that's absurd because... Uh, Growing up in Portland, we had skateboards and bikes everywhere, yeah. and a mm -hmm. lot of people that were black didn't afford cars, so if they didn't do TriMet, mm -hmm. they walked or they took a bike. So mm -hmm. it, it kind of injured the community, the biking community, that they, they felt like the black people didn't like them. Okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> so, okay. you know, when you say biking and seniors, yeah. I'm like, okay, that's a way to resolve yeah. one of yeah. those issues. Yeah. Let's yeah. get the seniors of all the different ethnicities to ride together, and let's do it for a common value, you okay. know? Boy, we're getting let's to the end. I got so many other questions. <laughs> I want to one real quick. Like, what about, many, what about many parks or many, many gardens in, in the neighborhoods? Maybe uh, in a four-block four area, you'd have a mini park where, where seniors could go and, and plant their gardens during the summer, if you will, or sit outside and look at the Roses, city of roses, right? Mm -hmm. Plant some roses and this, that, and the other. Yeah. What, yeah. what do you think well, about that? Well, they can like do that? it with the youth. Maybe the youth. Could you need support? That. Would you support something like that? I would. You would support something yes, like that. Oh, I tell you, you are good. I mean, we got to keep going on here. <laughs> Look. Okay, we got to keep. We got a supporter here. We got. We got a good supporter here. <laughs> well, you know. So, so any lasting comments you'd like to make? I just want people to uh, to always take advantage of the opportunity to be informed, to identify your needs, and to look for resources that can help you bring resolutions to your own problems. If we count on ourselves to to finish what we start, then I think we'll be better off. We can't always count on someone that doesn't know what our voice needs. Okay. So if we start using our voice, yeah. I think we'll. So get Teresa, how how do they get involved in your campaign? Tell them tell them how to get involved real they quickly. Can, they can go to the website TeresaForPortland.com. They can go to our Twitter page or our yeah. Facebook page. Uh, Twitter is Rayford for PDX 2012. All right. Congratulations. Keep up the good work. Thank All right. You. Good luck to you. Yes, sir. Again, this is Bruce Broussard. As George Page always said, back to what you believe in. Have a good one. Take care. <laughs> See you next week.